On tonight's show, UKIP beating the shit out of each other, the Tories have turned into Nazis, and Alistair Campbell will be here to account for the war in the Middle East. It's Saturday night, it's almost live, and it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's news thing. Joining Sam to watch helplessly as the country drifts to the far right. These days, you get arrested just for being English. It's Karen Danchuk. Why can't they go and heal the sick in their own country? It's Vanessa Feltz. And we should make them all wear badges or something. It's Bobby Mayer. And our special guest. He used to run the Labour Party's media operation like a well-oiled machine. Let's see how he feels now it's been sold for scrap. It's Alistair Campbell. Welcome to News Thing and thanks for joining me, panel. Now, UKIP had quite a week. It was so eventful, so rich in drama, pathos, intrigue and good old-fashioned fighting that had William Shakespeare himself been alive today, you'd have been forgiven for thinking that it was that mad bastard who made the whole thing up in his brain. Let's take a look at the key scenes. On Tuesday, Diane James stood down as leader after just 18 days. Now, the immediate bookie's favourite to replace her was the party's immigration spokesman, Stephen Wolfe. On Thursday, Wolfe was having a meeting in Strasbourg when he got into a row with a colleague. The two men stepped outside to clear the air on a couple of matters, and what happened next? Well, subject to an open investigation, so we can't speculate too much. But suffice to say, this is how it all ended up. Now, that, for me, is the best political image of all time. <laughs> even better than this one. <laughs> or even this. Or even this. Oh. So, what happened? Well, we can't be entirely sure, so, well, fuck it, let's just speculate. Apparently, the bloke who whacked Wolf was this fella, Mike Hookham. What a guy. A former Marine whose name sounds like he specialises in punching people. I mean, <laughs> you have to hand it to Wolf for even offering a straightener to a man like that. What more do we know about Hookham? Well, let's look at an interview he recently did with Sky News where he outlined UKIP's policy on Brexit. No, no, yeah, well, something? I'm true, but when, yeah. you're, when you're cranky and you're having a tear up, that ain't, and that, you ain't, because you're, yeah, you're, yeah. Well, say we're having a fight, you shave up, right? right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. 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 See, that's how I would do it. You're out of the game. After the scrap, Stephen Wolfe fell into a coma and was rushed to intensive care. For a few hours on Thursday, it appeared that he might actually die from a single punch. Which was sad and worrying, but at the same time, it was fucking awe-inspiring. I mean, one thing that unites all men is a deep secret desire to be able to kill another man with a single punch. And one day, perhaps even go by the nickname, One Punch, followed by your surname, like <laughs> One Punch Delaney or One Punch Mayor. I'm a man. Panel, it doesn't reflect well on Stephen Wolfe, though, that in a party that contains Nigel Farage, Nuttall, and that other one who's obsessed with gollywogs, that he's the one who gets punched spark <laughs> out. I mean, the whole thing is just superb, obviously, in every way. Yeah. I don't know anyone who isn't enjoying it, regardless of political persuasion. It's absolutely riveting. What a shame we haven't got a shot of one punch Hookham or whoever else it might have been punching or possibly not punching uh, old Stephen Wolf. But the thing that I really like best in the entire story is the fact that he is spark out on the floor, he's on his face, he's dead to the world, but he's still clutching his briefcase. Mm. Don't Good. you love that? That shows something about the guy. Professionalism, mm. efficiency. Or what was in the briefcase that he didn't want anyone else mm. to see? And, and yeah, and also then the moment he regained consciousness, there he is in his hospital bed, all hooked up to all sorts of really attractive kind of ERS yeah. um, machinery. I don't know why I'm holding my breath at this point, but anyway. And, That's and what Stephen Wolf can have that effect well, on. Well, he's lady. there like this, mm. giving interviews to the Daily Mail. As yeah. you do, don't Giving you? When everyone thought well. you were going to die. I love that in a hospital Absolutely. bed, don't you? I love that. It's all right. I'm it. not dead, Bobby. Is this where political debate in this country is heading? Are we just going to sort everything out now with, like, headbutt? I hope so. I'm just... <laughs> I, I'm just excited to figure out how they're going to blame it on immigrants. <laughs> like, yeah, at, yeah, at yeah. some point, everything that UKIP does, they bring back to immigration. Like, mm. Nigel Farage got stuck in that traffic jam once, and that was our fault. Mm. Apparently, Karen Danjuk, Mike Hookham, 
went on the run because he effectively thought for a few hours on Thursday that he was he had killed a man. Yes. And so he became a fugitive on the run <gasps> from the law. Uh, but he didn't manage to make it back to the UK, which I think is ironic because they're always saying it's so fucking easy <laughs> to get over to the UK from France. Um, you know, what do you think should happen to him? Oh, I don't know, because we don't know the circumstances. Did he throw the first punch or was it self-defence? Or was they both just having a little scrap? I mean, I, I'm more shocked that people... I mean, I've been in some heated debates in politics and I have to say we've never resulted in outside this door right now and get your fish ready. So I don't know. It's like, <laughs> this is just like, OK, what do we do from here? It's all a bit crazy. You've been in and around politics most of your life. Have, yes. you, never, have you ever had the urge to give someone a right-hander? Oh, yes. How close have you got? Very, very close. If it wasn't that the man was like 60 odd, I probably would have. Like, it really. You're not because... talking about your ex husband. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about <laughs> well, that. was close as well. But <laughs> it, it does become very close. But we haven't done anything so much since John Prescott gave that fellow a swift short arm. Oh, gosh, how many was that? Interesting, as well. because he, he went, that was during an election campaign, which Labour won by a landslide, and he actually, his popularity went up after he whacked that Welsh farmer. Um, do you think the same could happen now? I with think Stephen... Hookham, Hookham, Hookham yeah, could... might just edge old Wolf right out of the picture and end up being leader of the party, don't People they? People like fighting, don't they? I mean, yeah. ordinary voters like to see a politician who's They like someone who can look after themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Take yeah. themselves. Nobody... Handle themselves, we call it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, nobody wants a pussy to be the leader. No. Someone who, when, you know, when someone goes to punch you, just like, mm. like you don't I want said... that guy leading your tribe, like, you know? Uh, like into, into the world. Oh, no, Theresa oh, May no, looks like she could do that. Oh, don't you Theresa think Theresa May, May looks like... Oh, and you yeah, wouldn't right. even need to take off a Russell and Bromley and hook you with it. I think she could. <laughs> don't yeah. you? She looks hard. I yeah. OK, like thanks, panel. Hey, I wonder what Princess Diana's up to nowadays. Hello. Remember when I used to talk like that when I was down on Earth? Not anymore. Here's the showbiz gossip from heaven from me, Princess Diana. How many BGs have you been fingered by in the last month? Have a think. I bet it's not as many as me. <laughs> You're probably wondering who's going to be joining us up here next. Well, here's an exclusive for you. <laughs> oh, and Prince Philip. Can't wait to meet up with that old cunt again. Gene Wilder arrived here recently. Good looking fella. I think I'll ask him if he fancies a guy to tour of my chocolate factory. <laughs> right, I'm off. I'm trying to avoid Henri Paul. Diana, let's go for a drive. Fuck off, pal. Not after the last time. Now we're joined by our special guest, Alistair Campbell, who's just released volume five of his diaries. I haven't read all of it. Look at the bloody size of it. It's big. My first question it's is, big right... Talk. Alistair, you're a grown man. Mm -hmm. uh, who writes a diary? This is like, well, you're a 12-year-old girl. Do you have a little heart lock on the side of it? I mean, you can't stop publishing diaries. It's ridiculous. Well, if you feel like that, why did you get me on the programme? Uh, to ask you about other stuff. OK, fine. Um, well, I'll bring it back to the diaries every no, time. Yeah, look, we, we, have, we have looked through the diaries. It's interesting stuff in here. Um, a lot of it is about the era at which the Blair-Brown rivalry was reaching, like, its absolute apex, right? And there's an interesting story in there where Alex Ferguson, another dour, unpleasant Scotsman, <laughs> is saying that you should get rid of your dour, unpleasant Scotsman <laughs> because, be, he's, he, because he's, getting in, he's getting in the way. And I do sort of look at the situation the Labour Party are in now, and I think you can trace it back there, you know. If, if you and, and Tony Blair had had the balls to knife Gordon, just like the Tories would have done in the same situation, mm. then Labour might not be where they are now. That was definitely the, the, sen the question that goes through pretty much every page, because he thought about it a lot. And the point you made, what Alex actually said was that Gordon was like his brown kid. Yeah. Remember his number two mm. that eventually he felt was maybe thinking he was a number one. But the, the difference in politics and sport is that in politics, they stay on the pitch. They don't, you know, Tony could have asked Gordon to leave, but he wouldn't have disappeared. He'd still have been a big political figure. And he was, I mean, the, the truth is that Gordon, for all the faults and, you know, they're all in there, mm. uh, he also was a formidable talent. Um, uh, let's this talk... is when you do your funny bit, isn't it? No. OK, all right. Quite the reverse. We're oh. going to talk about the Chilcot Inquiry, which is only slightly longer than this diary. Mm. Um, although I did hear they were at one point thinking of using the same picture <laughs> on the front. 
Uh, now, you, are, you know, by all accounts, you, you got off well out of Chilcot. There was a lot of people who wanted you and Tony and the other people around you to come out as looking dodgy or bent. And actually, what you come out looking like is a bit gullible because there was just dodgy intelligence that you all fell for, right? Well, I mean, it's very difficult, I think, if you're him, the Prime Minister, or me working for the Prime Minister, and that's what the intelligence is saying. It's quite difficult, because I, mean, I think the Prime Minister does trust his intelligence services. I think if you take any big, big decision that, a, that an elected democratic leader takes, and you, you subject to the sort of scrutiny that that decision has now had, uh, you look what's going on in Syria now. Uh, I mean, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about Syria and... Go, go for it. Vladimir Putin, happy birthday, Vladimir. Uh, but the reality is there are consequences of action in Iraq. There have been consequences of inaction as well. Syria is a catastrophe, absolute catastrophe. Mm. And you could argue, you talk about learning lessons for Labour in this period. I think one of the big lessons that's been learned about Iraq is actually that it, they're scared of doing the really, really, really difficult things. Um, Blair hinted to Esquire this month he might return to British politics. Could he? I think he quite said that. I, read, I, I saw the headlines this morning, so I read it. I did that old-fashioned journalistic thing of, you know, finding out what the facts were. Oh, you, really? You Better than you did with that intelligence, then? Well, no, because that uh, was checked. Lesson learned. Nice cheap shot. Due but... diligence. <laughs> anyway, have you read the Roots article? No. What he basically says is that there is now a big debate to be had in British politics mm. about the role of the centre ground. So you've got this sort of right-wing hard Brexit thing on this side, and you've got the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, you know, clearly moving fairly substantially to the left, and then you've got a lot of people who are feeling a bit politically homeless who think that their politics is in the centre ground. So I think that's what he was yeah. saying, is that that debate has got to be had. Um, <clears throat> was that OK? That was good. What happened after question time with John McDonald? Did he call you a fucking arsehole? Um, I believe he did. I believe he did. Did it nearly come to a Mike Hookham, Stephen Wolfe situation? <laughs> no, no. I think we were... No, I th what, I'll tell you exactly what happened. We had had an agreement, the two of us, before question time. Let's not get personal, OK? Because yeah. it's pointless. In fact, it was he who had made that approach. I was actually, if you, if you, if you look at the programme, I was actually in a, for me, incredibly conciliatory... I was actually talking about mistakes we'd yeah. made yeah. as New Labour. And then he suddenly sort of pops out, oh, my God, this is nauseating. And I thought, what is he on about? And the truth is, I don't think he can hold himself back. I'm afraid there is an element of the Labour Party, and I think John McDonnell is part of it, they hate us, the Blairites, more than they hate the Tories. And I think he just couldn't resist having that. So I said to him as we came to the palace, you just can't help yourself. There's me trying to actually sort of, you know, hold things together, not get divisive, and you can't help yourself. So it got a bit... It got a bit... <clears throat> to be fair to him, I think I swore him before he swore at me. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. We'll be hearing from you later, and we'll be looking at the Tory party conference and asking, now that 52% of the country has voted to be racist, is the correct democratic response just to go along with them? See you after the break. <music> Welcome back. This week, the Conservative Party announced that they were racists, because, really, why the fuck not? I mean, who's left to call them out on any of this stuff? There's no opposition anymore. This government can do what the fuck they want. Theresa May is like Jerry when he's managed to get Tom thrown out of the house and he's just sitting about in a smoking jacket binging on a big wheel of cheese. <laughs> it's a shame that we're all racists now. I mean, this used to be a noble nation of justice and tolerance. Now we've been reduced to an embarrassing, small-minded and hostile nation of net curtain twitchers, encouraged to grass on our neighbours and treat outsiders with the kind of suspicion and contempt you'd usually only find in one of those westerns, where every time a stranger wanders into a saloon, everyone goes quiet, the piano stops and someone spits on the floor. <laughs> I was in Sunderland last week, that's not even a metaphor. <laughs> Let's look at some of the policy ideas that have come out of the conference. We've had a health secretary complain about all the foreign doctors that have the temerity to come over here and attempt to look after our sick and wounded. We've had a trade secretary who has said that foreign nationals are cards to be played in negotiations, like we're fucking 18th century feudal lords swapping 100 Spaniards and two good horses for tariff-free access to the free market. <laughs> And we've had a Home Secretary demanding that firms publish lists of the numbers of foreigners working for them. Look, 
I know with Brexit and Donald Trump and all of that, these Hitler comparisons are getting a bit boring, but fuck me. They couldn't come up with a more Nazi policy than if they were goose-stepping around Birmingham and announcing a quest to dig up the Ark of the fucking Covenant. <laughs> Amber Rudd defended our policy, saying we ought to be able to have a conversation about immigration in this country. Mate, what do you think we've been doing for the last two years? I'm fucking sick of talking about immigration. Can we not change the subject for a bit? Let's have a good old-fashioned chat about, I don't know, what pop stars we reckon might be lesbians or... Why they still haven't brought back big breaks? Seriously, snooker's as popular as ever. <laughs> People love quizzes, and Jim Davidson would fit right into the current climate. Oh. <laughs> Meanwhile, Theresa May claims that all she wants to do is look after ordinary, hard-working Britons. But who are these ordinary, hard-working Britons that politicians are always going on about? Who are the ordinary, working people of Britain? Well, they're just like you and me, except that they've got jobs they have to go to. Poor bastards. See, jobs are a load of things what you have to do to get money to buy grub. Hello, mate. Doing a bit of building, are you? He gets his money from putting buildings together out of bricks. Better get a move on, mate. Here's one of those lap dancing magnets. Going down the club to make sure all the girls have got enough lipstick and whatnot. He sometimes doesn't finish till 4am. <laughs> Not for me, mate. Still, it has his perks. <laughs> And here comes a neighbourhood drug dealer. While we're all cosy in bed, he's out on the streets making sure all the local junkies can get their fix. Sometimes he stays out all night flogging his gear. The pay's good, but I'll be blown if it beats a good 40 winks. So there you have it. The ordinary working people of Britain getting up five days a week to go and do a load of old nonsense just for a bit of dosh. Well... I suppose it's all right for them as likes it, but you can count me out. ta -ra! The Tories are playing classic divide and rule, toying with our innate willingness to believe that the only reason we're all tired and miserable at the end of the day is not because that's how life works, but because a load of Eastern Europeans are nicking our tax money and plotting to steal our dreams. Instead of what they're actually doing, which is working their asses off in the hospital all night, trying to make sure we don't die of booze and heart attacks. Panel, do you think the Tories even believe any of this shit, Vanessa? Oh, that's a heck of a good question. I think Theresa May is a, a, an extraordinary phenomenon and nobody understood what was going to happen. I think people thought she was a bit prefecty, a bit goody-goody, a bit sort of long socks and polished shoes, door monitor, that kind of thing. And everyone kept saying, including me, because everyone said it so often I believed in it, a safe pair of hands, which yeah. just meant boring beyond belief, soporific and an absolute dullard. And she's not, is she? She's really not. She's an extraordinary combo of kind of fiery uh, surprises and extravagances. Do I think she believes what she's saying? I have absolutely no idea. But it sounds as if she's been plotting and planning and hatching, dispatching and Lady Macbething for years behind the scenes waiting for this moment, doesn't it? Um, I mean, what, what does that mean? Why are we so excited that... It, why Are you just excited <laughs> that she's a woman who's going to ruin the country? Like, yeah, a woman can do it. Yeah. Oh, wow, it's a woman. Who gives a shit? I didn't if think Hitler, she I, was a woman. You that's mentioned what, it. You're saying it like, oh, it seems like she's been plotting like Lady Macbeth. Ooh, that's so sexy. Did Ooh, I? Somebody... Yeah. I find that sexy. That's Maybe you it's... find Lady Macbeth You're talking sexy. like it's that's so... Not me. It's so exciting that someone with tits is going to ruin everything. What do you think about British firms having to declare lists of all their foreign workers? I think it's absolutely inane, insane. And I, and I think even Amber Rudd kind of choked on it, didn't she? And immediately had to say, that's not racist. <laughs> <laughs> and you could see she was like, oh, oh God. And, and, and I mean, that was a hard one for her to spew out. So even harder to hear. So surely even harder to, for anybody to take seriously or enforce. I and mean, that was one of the, the not thought through back of an envelope, possibly actually focusing on whatever else was in the art, don't you think? Well, it's a pretty big thing to say and it has a quick trickle-down effect because it feels like it's legitimising all the nutters on the streets of Britain yeah. who want to hound these foreigners. Karen, uh, obviously, aside from us sat here, we need someone to stand up against this mad invective. How did you feel about learning that Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, was on a visit to Hadrian's Wall <laughs> and buying a new cardi for his wife while all this was going on? I think Jeremy is just an absolute nut job. <laughs> like, really, and I really want to like him. And I keep saying, yeah, I actually really like Jeremy, but then I think, I don't know what goes through his head. His conference and his party conference speech is just all about 
um, helping poor, helping this. But we're not actually talking. His focus is just absolutely in the clouds. And it needs to, what you've got the Tory party doing right now is feeding that gap from the middle. And whilst they're not going to do that for the normal man, they're telling all the normal man what they want to hear. So the normal man thinks this is great. And in the meantime, you've got Jeremy buying flaming cardigans. You know, it's just mm. like... And I'll tell you what, that wife it. of his, the only place she's going to be wearing that card is on the plane back to fucking Mexico if the Tories get their way. <laughs> and then he'll feel bad about not showing up to fight them. <laughs> Panel, thank you. There now follows a message from the Right Honourable Jeremy Corbyn. Good evening. My name is Jeremy Corbyn. I'm the leader of the Labour Party. That's right. I'm the fucking leader. Get used to it. I owed Ralph Miliband ten large in the early 90s after a pyramid scheme we were both involved in went tits up. Tell you what, says Ralph, I'll let you off the whole thing if you get my youngest, Ed, to lose his cherry. It was never going to be easy. If you think Ed Miliband's an awkward-looking cunt now, <laughs> you should have seen him in his adolescence. So it's 1991, and I take young Ed to the cinema to see Point Break. He was getting so excited over Patrick Swayze at one stage, I thought he might be one of them, you know. So I take him up the cleanest knocking shop I know north of the river. <laughs> What do you know, the silly bastard takes one look at the tarts on offer and shoots his muck and does a runner. <laughs> of course, I'd already paid by then, so I was obliged to step in and take care of the job young Ed wasn't up to. Not for the last time, I might add. <laughs> now, Alistair, welcome back. Thank uh, you, sir. Your former boss, Tony Blair, very divisive figure. And to my mind, very misunderstood. As you know, I am a fan of Blair, mm -hmm. OK? No one knew him like you do. So let's get some deeper insight into his mind and personality okay. with a game that we like to call You're the Tony Blair. You're the Tony Blair! So it's basically like you are the ref. You know you okay. are the ref. We, yeah, yeah. we paint a load of scenarios. You have to describe how you think Tony Blair would react. Because oh, people see. will always think the worst of him, which is unfair. So okay. let's start. Here's scenario one. You're booked in to do a voluntary speech to an orangutan charity. Mm -hmm. They've just signed you on to be an ambassador, and they're really excited. Mm -hmm. Two days before the event, you get a call from a Dubai oil shake. Mm -hmm. He offers you two million pounds to come and shake hands with his mates and watch a private performance by the pop star Nicki Minaj mm -hmm. in his front room. Mm -hmm. Problem is, it's the same day as the orangutan charity event. Yeah. You're the Tony Blair. He does the orangutans. I'm telling you. But? 80% of his stuff is pro bono. He does the orangutans. <laughs> OK, he does the orangutans. <laughs> right, scenario two. You're at Alton Towers mm -hmm. with Cherie and the kids. This would have been a few years ago and the kids were still little, right? You paid extra for fast track tickets so you can jump the queue. Mm -hmm. Because you've worked hard all year and you feel you deserve it. But as you're walking past the normal queue, mm -hmm. a drunk single mother steps in front of you and yells, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. There might be a disabled child in the queue or a refugee or something. You make me sick. You're the Tony Blair. Mm -hmm. uh, his security guards take control of the situation. Bustle him through. Seriously? Oh, I think so, yeah. I think they might just feel slightly threatened and then Tony will be able to say, and he, he'll sort of wave back and say, being, Sorry. being pushed on, being pushed on, yeah. See, nowadays, you, you when you were in charge of, of the communications, not everyone had a camera phone filming that, sticking it straight up on social media. That would have been a much bigger challenge for you, wouldn't it? Because mm, yeah, that possibly, wouldn't have looked possibly. good. Yeah, but you'd have had. What, what came into my mind when you said that was Sharon Storer in 2001 election. Do you remember the woman outside the hospital? Oh, yeah. Really giving it to yeah. him? You didn't need social media because you had TV cameras all yeah. around it. So, yeah, yeah it doesn't, it, it's just a question you of You got scale. lucky that day because Prescott punched the farm the same day. He did, correct. Good Vol campaign knowledge, huh? Volume four. Yes, because I've been reading all your diaries. Get the old one. Um, Right, your neighbour's cat is terrorising your cat to the point where your cat's scared to go outside for fear of being beaten up. You've asked your neighbours to do something about it, they don't care. Mm -hmm. John Prescott comes round, says he knows a bloke who can chuck it in a lake for 20 quid. But Jack Straw suggests it would be better to put it on a train up to Glasgow and let it make a new life for itself. You're the Tony Blair. Don't have a cat. 
Never had a cat, never going to have a cat. Why not? He's a cat hater. No. Oh, he hates got cats cat. now. Not going to cat. Uh, no, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have a cat. Why not? You didn't do your research again. What? Don't you start on it. Do don't try research. and turn it round. Why doesn't Tony Blair have a cat? The public have a right to know. He travels too much. and You can't take it everywhere you go. Last question. Yeah. You've asked your PA at Tony Blair Associates to make sure the office is always stocked up with jammy dodgers. But every time you go in, she's left the packet open and they've all gone soft. Right. You've already warned her three times. She just won't listen. You're the Tony Blair. Um, he'd be nice to her. She's so nice, his PA. So, uh, no, he'd, he'd the forgive biscuits. her. The biscuits are just going to... They're, they're, they're just the price you pay for having a great PA. He'd be nice to her face. And then he'd go, Alice, we've got to fucking do something about these biscuits because I'm sick to death of it. I've got all these oil shakes coming with <coughs> no, I keep no, no, giving no, no, them no. socky biscuits. He could take the biscuits to give to the orangutans, couldn't he? Oh, yeah. Because nice they won't them. care. Yeah, they won't care. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, I think that's uh, cleared a lot up. Alistair Campbell, <laughs> thank you ever so much for thank joining you, us. Thank you. Thanks also to my panel, Karen Danchuk, Bobby Mayer and Vanessa Fels. By the way, did everyone see that Kardashian heist this week? It was sensational. A glamorous Hollywood star in Paris, a daring £9 million jewel robbery. It had all the hallmarks of a great 60s caper movie starring David Niven as some kind of dashing gentleman thief. And I'm like, okay, this is like a little much. Let's, you know, I was like sitting there, like just like crying, like.